the uh, fundamental tension is basically how do you reconcile a market economy with a Leninist political system? So what you have seen in the last three weeks is that they are, I think they're really in the sense of panic. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. The Chinese economy today is uh, at the center of attention for many reasons. First of all, we're all uh, very curious uh, uh, to how it will emerge from COVID. Uh, the strength of its recovery will have significant influence on the health of the entire world economy. But even more important, the long-term prospect of China are very important for the future of the capitalist system. China is very often portrayed uh, both as the biggest success of capitalists and as the primary alternative model of capitalism, which, if either are true, and how the Chinese economies will influence not only 2023, but the rest of the first half of the 21st century, are extremely difficult but fundamental questions. To try to answer them, we invited a China expert, my colleague Chang Tai She, professor of economics at Chicago Booth. So let me start off with the question that you asked on whether what's happened in China over the last few decades, it's it's a triumph of capitalism or whether it's a challenge to capitalism. I, I very much view it as it represents a triumph of capitalism. So let me describe what the system was like in China 15 years ago. It's a system of what I'm going to call, for lack of a better term, it's a system of crony capitalism, that if you have a project, you find somebody in the Chinese local government to become your partner. It's also a hugely competitive system. That is, it's not that there's one local government for you to do this with. There are several thousand of them. So large segments of, of the economy, many, many businesses start to become part of this crony system where they basically got access to everything that they needed, where they had think about it, good capitalist type of institutions. So it's a very different way of doing it, but I think that the outcome at the end of the day is the same. So if you think about what that does in, in terms of the loyalties of the local politicians, that is, you know, you have these businesses depend critically on these local politicians, and what it also does is that it basically makes the local politician they start to care a lot more about these local businesses that they are responsible for than what their bosses in the party apparatus wanted them to do. The party has been responding to this by basically cracking down on all the possible sources of political opposition, including some of the most successful Chinese firms. It started in roughly 2018 when you start to see the crackdown on the big financial conglomerates. And then starting in 2020, you start to see the crackdown on the tech firms. And the really interesting thing that we've seen in the last three weeks is that campaign that they have been on for the last five years of cracking down on the large firms, they have basically said, that's over. And I think that the situation that we are in now is that my interpretation is that the party is really in panic. You know, they, they are seeing that, that the growth is low. I mean, the other thing that I think has really contributed to their sense of panic is the rules that the U.S. government rolled out in October of 2022. I think they were really shocked by that. They never thought that, that, that the U.S. government would do what they did, where they basically rolled out these draconian export controls where it was clear that their goal was to kill the Chinese semiconductor industry, regardless of whether they were private or whether they're small or whether they were big, regardless of whether they were Chinese firms or whether they were for foreign firms. Like the export controls applied to Intel's facility in China. And then the other part of the controls that were laid out is that they made it illegal for an American citizen to work for a Chinese semiconductor company which really kills them because all of their senior 
management and all their senior engineers and scientists are U.S. citizens. Uh, a U.S. citizen, and never ever has the U.S. government ever done something like this. I think they're really in a sense of panic. Is the messy way in which China has exited zero COVID emblematic of this panic at all? I guess I've always thought that if there were two words that defined the Chinese state, it was control, yeah. it was control and competence. And the exit from zero COVID appears to be neither controlled nor nor competent. And that 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 could be um, a misperception on the part of outsiders, or it, it, it could be accurate. But I'd I'd love to know what that what that says about the state of affairs inside China. Yeah, no, I think that it's. It's panic. I mean, it's panic. Uh, the protests in November really shook them, because they were nationwide, and they were also, you know, not restricted to specific groups. That it was it, it was a young, it was the elderly. It, they were professionals. There were people that they were blue collar workers. So I think that they were that they were really terrified by the panic, uh, by by the protest to end COVID zero in the way that they did. So is the verdict from where we are now that crony capitalism works, that crony capitalism doesn't work, or that crony capitalism can work for a period of time? I guess I would say that it depends, right? It, 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 it depends. So let, let me give you a story to illustrate this, not from China, but from another, another country. So there's this, in the Asian financial crisis, you know, for people in Asia, there was this picture of the managing director of the IMF standing over the shoulders of Suharto. The event there was that Suharto was being forced to, to sign a law where he would close down the banks that were owned by his children. That was the condition that the IMF imposed uh, for providing financial assistance to Indonesia. This was very much sort of the way that the people at the IMF thought about it, that one of the reasons that Indonesia was in the state that it was in in 1998 was because of the system of crony capitalism. That e event was meant to send a signal to the world that the system of crony capitalism is over. You no longer need to give a 10% equity share to one of uh, Sue Hartos' kids. Right? And then this is the story that was given to me by a wealthy Chinese entrepreneur. So the way that these deals worked uh, took place in uh, Indonesia. It was it was almost always uh, uh, Chinese entrepreneurs, and they basically made deals with somebody from uh, Suharto's family. So the question that I posed to him is, well, is this what you thought? Uh, is this what you thought? And he said, no, 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 of course not. What what went through my mind was that, oh my God, Suharto is so weak that he cannot even pr he cannot even protect his children. How can he protect my property? And then he said, what, as soon as I saw this, I took all my money and I went to Singapore. What happened afterwards was basically five years of uh, economic recession for Indonesia. Like, because the question is, like, there the question is, there clearly is a system of crony capitalism, and that was the way that things worked in uh, Indonesia. But what is the counterfactual, Right is when you get rid of the system, is the counterfactual that, that Indonesia is going gonna, is gonna to be like Sweden? Or are you going to get back to, I mean, this was exactly what the guy said. He said that, you know, I was afraid that it was going to go back to the days of chaos under Sukarno from the, the 1960s, where there was no, where I have no idea what is going to protect my property. Whereas in the days of Suharto, I understood very well how to make my business grow. Like it was a very clear, you know, rules of the game. It's a terrible system in, in, in many ways, of course. It's a terrible system in many ways. But the question is, it's a terrible system relative to what? But, sorry, exactly during the financial crisis, Raghu uh, Rajan and I wrote a piece uh, called Which Capitalism, in which uh, we compare the Suharto model with the, if you want to call Anglo-Saxon model. And we say that when you are far from the technological frontier, both could work pretty well. The problem is that as you become more sophisticated, the system based on a influential uh, either man or party really become more and more difficult to sustain, and, and eventually you collapse. And, and uh, let me add something else, is that in the period of rapid growth, it's very easy to have incentive schemes that work because the promise of the future is very large and the temptation to steal uh, what you have there is very small. And, and 
Italy after World War II walked exactly in its way. There wasn't a communist party. It was called Christian Democrats, but it walked exactly in the same way. And then uh, in 92 came a crisis. It, we tried to clean up a bit of the corruption, but the reality is we couldn't go back to a system, or we couldn't not go back, we couldn't go to a system of uh, arms length contracting and so on and so forth. And without the promise of a brilliant future, the system collapsed. And, and from basically 92 to today, Italy has not grown. It's been a complete disaster. So what are the chances that uh, China is entering this phase? Because, you know, so far, the prospect was fantastic and grew like uh, crazy. But just now we learned that uh, population is starting to decline and it might go in the opposite direction. I think that's absolutely right. So another way to put this is that growing in this way, growing in the pre-1992 Italian way, or growing in the Suharto way, or growing in the Chinese way, it works really well until a certain point. But then what it also does is that it it sets you up, it puts you on a path for which it's very, it, it makes it much more difficult to get to a place uh, that is different. Uh, the Financial Times, on the morning that we're recording this podcast, the Financial Times just started doing a, a, a series, the first piece in a series investigating how Apple has tied its fortunes to China. And Apple seems yeah. to be a pretty extreme example in terms of U.S. companies that have built their future on, on China. But what do you think the ramifications are for companies that have spent decades building supply chains in China? Would you be, <laughs> if you if you could tell them what to do, would you be telling them to disentangle or would you be telling them to stay tangled? I would be telling them that they that they need to diversify. I mean, they need to diversify. I I, I don't think that fully disentangling is an option uh, is an option, but they clearly they clearly need to die. Uh, they clearly need to diversify. Going back to your notion of a of a panicking China, I'm going to ask the myopic, self centered American question: Is that good or bad for America? Or if we broaden it out a bit, is that good or bad for the rest of the world? It depends on how you want to think about China, right? So that as an economist, we believe that global prosperity is good for everybody. There's also, I think, this growing view among the American political establishment, uh, and I'll be blunt about it, that we would, we in the U.S. and the world would be better off if China were stuck at what they were in 1978. And I don't really know how to think about that. I was just say I, I don't. I, I guess it depends on whether I'm putting on my hat as a as an economist or whether I'm putting on my hat as, let me just say, somebody from the national security establishment in the U.S. Even as an economist, and it says, of course, there are a lot of gains from trade, and we recognize them. But I think that we should recognize more the zero sum games where the United States is getting an enormous advantage. Think about, for example, the extraordinary privilege of uh, everybody using the, the dollar and the kind of rent that we get from that every year. Those are enormous rents. It's also rent because people export to this country goods and we get them piece of paper. OK, so that, that's like a real valuable, no, not to mention the competition in the world coming from a country that is a province of an empire. I think that you see that when uh, push comes to shove, American companies have the support of the U.S. government, uh, who has the implicit threat of the U.S. army, and have a comparative advantage. So I think that the gains that U.S. Uh, firms and, in general, uh, American citizens are getting as a result of the dominance of the world is not trivial. And that gain is at risk from a country like China, who says, at the very minimum, we want to be on equal footing, okay? Now, you can argue that China thinks that they are the center of the world because they've always been at the center of the world for, like, most of their history, and so they want to be not on equal footing. They want to be on a superior footing. But let's take the uh, generous interpretation. They want to be on an equal footing so that uh, we have half of the international institution, like the IMF, the World Bank, in Beijing and not in, in Washington. Okay, so that's it. But let, let me put the question in there. So, so, that, so I, I, I take your point. But let's like ask the same question from the from the vantage point of somebody from Italy, where, you know, there is nobody is using the Italian currency. Italy has no hope of dominating world in, in, in institutions like the U.S. So let's ask the question from the vantage point of an Italian or from the vantage point of a British. 
or from the vantage point of somebody from France, are they better off with if China continues to grow at 10% a year for the next four decades, or are they better off if China goes into economic decline? But that's an easy one. Of course, they're better off if China continues to grow, but they're better off for two reasons. One, the strict economic reasons that you mentioned, the gains from trade, uh, but that would be true also of an American. But in addition, for a European, I can say, I think having a more balance of power at the world level might actually be beneficial. My view is that Africa benefited tremendously from the Cold War because there, was, there were two sort of uh, potential sources of power, and by playing one against the other, they were getting some out of it. And in a world in which there is only one hegemon, you can't play that game. I have a slightly different uh, way of, of asking the question, maybe, which is what if it's not China versus the U.S., but what if it's politics versus economics? And I was thinking about this because for all the political talk and the very real moves that the Biden administration has made against China, Bloomberg just reported that Chinese U.S. trade is reaching record levels. So you have this economic cooperation that is still taking place at the same time as the political rhetoric is escalating. At the same time, China still owns almost a trillion dollars of U.S. debt. We, yeah. we can't handle it if they start selling. So does economics actually prevail at, at, at the end of all this? You know, the way that I think about it, like I, the way I think about it is like, I think about it in, in like in the same, like in the way that Gary Becker used to think about discrimination. That you have somebody, the CEO of this company is a racist and his basic, his basic answer is that that's fine. That's fine that the guy, the, the, the guy is, is, is a racist because he's going to pay a cost. He's going to have to pay higher wages. He's going to pay for, for to get comparable workers. And as long as he's willing to pay for it, it's all monetized. Right? It, it's, all, it, it, it's all monetized. The question is, are we okay with that? Are we okay with somebody being a racist and being fully, fully willing to pay the cost? You can make an argument that even if that person is willing to pay the cost, we are not okay with that. So if the Chinese are willing to pay a cost for their political goals, right? To uh, to have this Leninist political system, they're they're going to suffer some economic damage from from that. Are we okay with 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 that? And I, I think that there are good reasons to think about the the, the good. Good reason for why we may, may not be, be be okay, but you, you can see that I don't really know how to think about that. I like, like I let, let me try to answer this by 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 telling. In two thousand and nineteen, Janos Kornai had this op-ed in the Financial Times that was titled "I Have Created a Frankenstein," and what he was referring to was that Janos Kornai was really a central figure in Chinese in China's economic reform in the 1980s. He basically was a central person in designing the initial package of a Chinese uh, economic reform. He was a key mentor to the first wave of young Chinese that left China. He trained them at, at Harvard, and some of the most senior people in the party, the senior economists of the party, were former students of Janos. Uh, so then what he said in this piece is that, you know, in the 1980s, I believe that by helping China's economic reform, this would be a force of good in the world. But look at what has happened. It's become a lot more successful than what I thought it would be. The economy has grown. And look at what they have done with their economic success. And then he said, mea culpa, uh, mea, uh, mea culpa, that I made a mistake in the 1980s. And then and he said, it's time for us to say, that's enough. Best thing for us to do is to stop helping the Chinese economy grow. That's one view of it. And I will say that that view really shook his former students in China, uh, because these are some of the most senior people in the party. And he was a critical figure for them. He was like their father mentor figure. And having him say that, I think, really shook a lot of people to their core. But it's a deep question that you ask, uh, Bethany. And I, I, I don't, because there's one part of me that I think views that growth is good, uh, is good for everybody. Uh, and then there's also this, I mean, that's sort of my training, uh, my training, and that's generally the way I think about the world. But then it's also, I put on sort of the, the, the other parts of me, and I don't quite know how I come out. So, so let, let me help you in this calculation, if I may. So if we have 
a small shop owner who is racist moving into town, we can dismiss him, right? Because uh, it's not going to affect the equilibrium. It's not that important, etc. But if we have like a big, big guy who owns half of the town with a very, very clear racist opinion, as a non-racist person, you feel like uh, completely affected and, and you want to resist politically to this uh, entry. And I feel that the problem with China is how big it is and how influential it is. So I got really scared when uh, the general manager of the Houston Rockets, uh, Daryl Morey, had to apologize for having retweeted a very sort of a benign tweet of uh, freedom in Hong Kong, something that we, we do all the time and people do all the time and it's not like a, such a big deal. And all of a sudden, this becomes uh, an hostile gesture to China. And at the beginning, the NBA, then they retracted the bit, but at the beginning, the NBA went and did karakiri in front of the Chinese government. So my concern is that Chinese buying power which is uh, controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, is so large in the West that basically is changing the nature of democracy in the West as a result. So what do you think about that? I think there's something to the argument. I think there's something to the argument. I would just say that the Chinese Communist Party, I don't think they really have any goals about, they really care about what goes on in the rest of the world. I think... Their main focus is about domestic political control. So I guess I, my sense that I, I, I don't really think that they pose a threat to democracy in the rest of the world. They clearly pose a threat to democracy in China. Even if they only pose a threat to democracy or the, the, to China, I, I don't really completely buy the view that, well, it's China and we shouldn't care about what goes on, what the Chinese political system is. I think that we we should still care, right? We, we, we should, and so I, I put some weight on that. You can see that I really am conflicted here. <laughs> uh, uh. I buy 100% the fact that China is only interested in China, and so they're only interested in their internal politics. However, for example, a U.S. election could have a huge impact on that. And imagine there are two candidates, and one is more pro-China, and the other is uh, want to have a, a tougher stand on China. I don't think it would be past the Chinese government to interfere in the election. And, and, and we, we went uh, on a rampage because of some interference from Russia. We don't still know the magnitude of it. But if we have serious inter- interference from China, that would be kind of massive. And I think that, that that's uh, very possible today. And maybe it's happening today and we're not even uh, sure because it's very under... The radar, and it says the pressure that companies exert not to detach from China is probably huge and is not something that we can measure very easily. Yes, no, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, I don't have a sense that they, 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 they are in the business of like funneling campaign contributions to political, to, uh, political candidates. My sense is that they don't quite know how to do that. But there could be a day in which it happens. Right? Uh, uh, I, I don't know. The way that they do it is that there are these, you know, there are lots of American companies that have extensive business, uh, extensive business operations in China. Hank Greenberg and 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 uh, uh, I must know the CEO of uh, Tesla. I'm drawing a blank this afternoon. Musk. Elon Musk. Musk. <laughs> Musk. Uh, oh my God, that makes me so happy that you drew a blank on his name. I think that's fabulous. <laughs> Musk. Uh, 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 you know, he understands well that his billions of dollars of subsidies depend on the party, right, uh, on, on, on the party. So whenever, like, the person that is responsible for giving him the subsidies says, hey, it would be helpful if you were to do this, then obviously he's going to do it, right? He's, he's going to do it. And he doesn't, they don't directly have to say, oh, you know, what you get in this, what you get here depends on you trying to help, trying to help us out in, uh, on this other dimension. Uh, it's just... I mean, Bethany, you have covered this type of thing for uh, for a long time. So you, I might, I, I, you know, I think that you, you probably have have a good sense of, on how it on how this thing actually works. 
And I, I do. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. I guess it ties into me to the discussion we are having about about whether economics should win and, and whether we can even control whether economics wins. And given the subterranean ways in which economic pressure exerts itself politically, it makes me worried about how much of a choice we have in saying this is what the policy should be, um, given, given these, again, subterranean channels through which economic pressure is exerted. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. So, so let me try something. So imagine that I was an aggressive anti-Chinese. I'm not, but suppose. And I say, oh, you're telling me that they are in the panic. This is the moment to actually be tough because uh, if they are in the panic, we can obtain a lot by putting them with a shoulder against the wall. On the other hand, somebody might say, wait a minute, you don't want to put a powerful uh, entity like China with a shoulder against the wall because you never know how to react. I know the two are extreme, but where do you fall into this spectrum? I guess that I would, what the way that I would approach it is that I would couple things. So then let me, so suppose the question is, how should the, how should the University of Chicago engage with China? And I think about what is it that the Chinese want? Science and technology stuff. They don't really want engagement in the humanities and the social sciences, because that is politically dangerous. I would couple these two things. Unless your goal is to completely blow, is to, is to blow China out of the water. And I, I don't think that that, I, I guess I'm not at the stage uh, where, where, where I think that, that that is what we should be doing. Thank you, Chang. That was great. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. It seems so right to me that, yes, the, the messy end to China's zero COVID strategy is an interesting analogy for the end to the Chinese e economic miracle. And I actually, I have trouble, but this might be my limited imagination, and I'm going to contradict myself in a second. I have trouble seeing a way in which it's, it's not, given the other challenges in the Chinese economy, namely the property sector, and given the dem demographic issues that are, that are facing China. I, I, don't, I don't see an easy way. Way out. That said, there's a, a guy who's an old China hand that I've talked to a lot over the years, and his um, position has always been that what the West always, always underestimates China and that we don't understand. And we constantly think that it's going to play by the same rules that the rest of the world has played by and that we just don't get it. And so I'm very aware of the fact that I, I really just don't get it. So Yeah, I feel the same way. It's a bit like uh, Mark Twain. Uh, the news of my death has been vastly exaggerated. Uh, and the, yes. the news about uh, uh, Chinese yes. end of miracle has been announced so many times. Yes, and that, it's been wrong uh, every and, time. And, and every time so far has been wrong. Now, yes. eventually it's going to be right. <laughs> the question <laughs> the broken, is... <laughs> the bro so, well, while we're on the cliche front, the broken clock is that, that was right twice a day. <laughs> yeah. Now, eventually it's going to be wrong. And the question is whether uh, this is the time. Certainly, the convergence of factors is unprecedented. As you said, it's not out of the question they might pull out of it in some miracle, miraculous way. They've done it before. But I think this time is, is uh, stronger than, than the others. It is. Maybe it's a piece of this rather than a tangent. But the fact that China insisted on developing its own vaccine rather than using the vaccines developed in the West and that that vaccine has been shockingly less efficacious than the Western vaccines is an, an interesting tangent to this story because it does in some ways as messy and downright disgusting as, and wasteful as our healthcare system is at the, at the end of the day, that, that mess and waste seems to have beaten out central planning when it comes to developing a vaccine that can work because I was just going back and reading some of the remarks at the beginning of the pandemic, and they were both that authoritarian countries were probably better at managing pandemics than democracies were, and that China's response to the pandemic was, whatever it was, by far more competent than the U.S. response and then, and then the Western response. And on top of that, there's the fact that the West lurched to copy China in, 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 into lockdowns, which we could never really successfully emulate, but we lurched into copying China rather than 
than thinking through, rather than having the, the self-confidence, the intellectual self-confidence anymore to say what works for the West, and it may not be what, what works for China. And it was all done under the guise of extraordinary or under the belief of extraordinary Chinese competence. And now we look back three years later, and it turns out that maybe maybe that wasn't quite what it was cracked up to be. And so I think comparing that to the economics, which we, everybody has believed for a long time that the Chinese economic miracle was a miracle, and it was, and would never come to an end. What if, what if it contains within it some of, the same, some of the same failings? What we don't fully appreciate that in part of this miracle, uh, like in part of every success, that might be the seeds for its own demise. And uh, clearly, the zero COVID policy was very successful until it wasn't. And I think that what I fear or what I hear Chang say, and I think there are a lot of elements, is maybe also in this case is the Chinese miracle has been a phenomenon, probably the most important in the history of the world, because having such a large nation develop at such a fast pace for 40 years has been game changing. OK, but like every success, so the seeds of its own demise. And, and here is the, 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 the seeds are coming uh, to a point that why it might have an impact. Number one, politically, you have a system that is about the preservation of the party that works really well if the preservation of the party coincides with uh, economic growth, as it has done so far, but doesn't work equally well when it, it doesn't. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is what Chan was saying about the economy it's a very, I think it's the best interpretation I, I ever heard about the Chinese economy, is an economy where there is plenty of corruption, but the corruption is given in form of equity rather than in form of bribes. And we know that equity is very good in a world of growth. So it's a corrupt system with terrible distributional consideration. But if you have double-digit growth, who cares about the distribution? Okay, And if you double-digit growth, who cares about the ultimate efficiency as long as you can paper over? Okay, But now that the growth might slow down, this system might implode, and this is not easy to find a replacement. It's a bit like Italy. Everything is, is uh, sort of uh, among friends, but the moment you have actually to create a more institutionalized markets, you don't have the institutions. And those institutions cannot be created overnight. And all of this under the pressure of a competition with the United States. Until recently, the United States were not competing with China. Now, the United States is competing with China. And uh, beware. There's actually an interesting analogy to Enron because Enron created all these structures that only worked as long as its stock continued to go up. And if its stock ever continued, ever went down, then the whole thing came crumbling down. And what you and Chang have discussed with China's method of crony capitalism is also a system that in effect only works and works really beautifully as long as the stock is going up. But if the stock ever starts to go down, then the, then, then the whole thing crumbles. I think that what it tells us is that the Chinese government is for and foremost uh, dedicated to the preservation of the Chinese Communist Party power. Everything is instrumental to that. So it's not necessarily a government uh, aimed at economic growth. Economic growth is functional to the survival and success of the Communist Party. What I realized talking to Chang is uh, that China is in a panic mode, clearly was in a panic mode about the end of COVID. And that's the reason why ended up being so brutal. And I don't know whether we'll ever know what the human cost has been, but it's certainly very large. And also, the, the part that I really did not know, and, and, and Chang uh, was very clear about, is how much actually what the Biden administration is doing is biting. In, in the fact that the prohibition uh, of having any, any US citizen being involved into anything that's to do with uh, semiconductor is a really, really big deal for China. Please join the Stigler Center for the next webinar in our series on China's political economy. In this one, we'll explore whether there is a new era in the country's development. Learn more and register at chicagobooth.edu slash Stigler China series. So if only, if I were going to play devil's advocate and try to challenge you, th this, 
and I have I don't totally understand this number. Maybe you do, but the idea that trade between the U.S. and China is hitting record levels again does seem to suggest that some of at least one piece of your puzzle that some of what the Biden administration is doing is there's there's a lot of rhetoric, and it does seem like this action would be a major one economically, and yet trade between the two countries isn't slowing down. So what's the What's true at, at the end of it all? Is the rhetoric between the U.S. and China more true, or do the numbers about trade speak to a different truth? More the latter. I think that uh, the Biden administration is probably smarter in its uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis China than the Trump administration. As I said, Trump was uh, not particularly well articulated in trying to hit the, the, the soft spot. So if we keep importing uh, toys from China, I don't think this is damaging the United States, no particularly helping China. It might help China a bit, a bit because uh, of the unemployment, but I don't think it's going to change the, the balance of power in the world. However, if we transfer major technology to China, this is going to change in an irreversible way uh, the, the balance of power. And up to 2016, I think the United States has been fairly oblivious to this fact. And I heard Chang in a different talk tell the story about how the, the Chinese, for example, auto industry started to copy the American one. And the, the American auto industry kind of understood, but uh, not to the full extent. And, and I think there's, there's a lot of being uh, appropriation, which, you know, I don't think is particularly bad because every developing nation has done that. And the United States were mastered it when uh, they were an infant republic. So I don't think it's necessarily terrible, but it's something that uh, if you care about the, the world geopolitics is very important. And uh, the semiconductor industry is a crucial uh, step. And I think that uh, the Chinese sees this very clearly and they're fearful. Now, the question I don't have uh, very clear in my mind is, how do you prevent this from turning into a dangerous panic? I think we discussed this uh, early on when we were talking about Ukraine last year, that the Japanese attacked Perabo because they knew that they only had oil for uh, 12 months. And so that was the only chance of survival. So when you put uh, a power with a shoulder against the wall, you don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, I guess it goes back to my question, is this a good thing or a bad thing or a mixture of both? And I thought Chang was very nuanced about that. I don't think, though, I just wanted to make a point on your idea that no one understood what was happening. I think people absolutely understood. There were warnings going back to the 1990s about what would happen if we outsourced American technology um, to China. It's just that no one cared enough to do anything about it. Or, I, I, well, I can't figure out. I can't figure out if it was an American naivete that, oh, democracy has won and capitalism is one, and this is all going to work out to our advantage in the end, so who really cares? Or if it was just that business trumped national politics for a long time, national identity. And so because it was good for various companies economically, no one stopped the economic gravy train, even though it wasn't good for national security or necessarily for, for, for our future. But the idea that no one saw that this was happening, plenty of people saw that it was happening. And I do wonder, you know, for all the horrors of President Trump, Another question I was going to ask you, if he hadn't acted, did his actions make it possible for Biden to take his, his actions? Would President Biden have been able to act if it had not been for what the Trump administration had already done? Or did the Trump administration's actions make it harder for Biden to act? That was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, let's divide into two. Let's first go to the, to the first point that, that you raise. And let me throw you the card that actually Chang used that I thought was very interesting. The, the case of Kornai, this economist, I had not read at the time the, the FT, and I went back and read it. I think it's a fascinating piece because, uh, first of all, Kornai is a Hungarian economist who grew up in a communist country. So is not your typical naive American that sees uh, only one, one side. And uh, while he's an economist, I don't think he was particularly in, in the pocket of business or bus American business interests. So I think he was generally a believer that by opening up the economy, giving them uh, the, the chance to blossom, they will turn into a democracy and will be part of the rest of the world. If you think of it, this is what happened with Germany and Italy, but particularly Germany that was sort of uh, 
until the end, it, Italy, as you know, considered way before the end of the war. But uh, uh, <laughs> Germany went to the end, but then became one of the strongest uh, U.S. allies. And the same is true to some extent to, 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 to Japan. So I think it was a legitimate bet, bet that went wrong and is easy to, to say exposed, uh, you were stupid or you didn't see it. But, uh, and, and what impressed me, actually, is that Janusz Kornai was able to actually say, we made a mistake. And it's not common to see people saying, we made a mistake, especially in the world of economists. Uh, we economists are all arrogant, so we, we never say we made a mistake. Journalists are not any better, by the way. <laughs> uh, and he did. Uh, and, and, uh, and apparently had a huge impact on, uh, on China because he had so many students there. But in the, the, the terms, he doesn't uh, pull punches in his article. It's very harsh on what China has turned into. Um, and and I think that uh, uh, Chang put it very uh, strongly: is are we at the level that uh, dealing with China is like dealing with Nazi Germany? And it's just, my my first reaction say no, no right. uh, but then you think a little bit more calmly and you say, okay, uh, if all those stories I read and I honestly don't know they are true, but of for example. Uh, massive sterilization of a Yugo's population and uh, are true. If the stories are true, what is the difference? If you're enjoying this podcast, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show to check out. It's called Nine Questions with Eric Oliver. Have you ever wondered who you are, but you don't know who to ask? Then join Professor Eric Oliver as he poses the nine most essential questions for knowing yourself to some of humanity's wisest and most interesting people. Listen to Nine Questions, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. For sure, I did not understand until Chang articulated it, and this might just be my failure to have read enough, but I did not understand how severe the restrictions the Biden administration had put in place were. I don't think I realized the prohibition on on, on U.S. employees, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that, it, it's, that, that feels like a lot more than rhetoric to me, to answer my own question about how much of this is rhetoric based on the, the trade numbers coming out of China and how much is actually re, a real, how much of this pre- is a real economic change between the two countries. That feels real. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it is real. And the decline in um, investments, I think that investments look farther away than trade. Trade is basically now, investment is about the future. And if you look at uh, uh, the investment, particularly venture capital investments in technology, they're basically zero now. Uh, And that is a sign that uh, the world has changed dramatically. Although countering that, this piece, the series that the FT has, the Financial Times has run about Apple's involvement in China and the extent to which Apple has bet on China and basically entangled its supply chain with China also says that and Chang seconded this, or, or, or that's going to be very, very difficult for a company like Apple to extricate itself and for other companies too. So that does that does run counter to whatever the U.S. government wants to achieve, just the reality of how deep and strong those ties are, that he, that it, it's, it's difficult. And I remember talking to a semiconductor CEO a while ago, six months ago maybe, and he said, we all want to get out of China. We all want to diversify our supply chains. What we've all realized is we can't. It's, we're really stuck. That it, it's very, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, but at some level, you might argue this might be good because I fear a situation in which uh, the Chinese economy is really free falling because everybody is running away, and the Communist Party realized that what are his chances to remain in power if not uh, the one, for example, to start a war? Because in this situation. Uh, to blame the West. And if there is nothing to be gained from the West, I think that uh, uh, escalating the tension about Taiwan, the, the Chinese feel very, very strongly about Taiwan and um, would be very tempted to, to actually invade. On, on the flip side, going back to what... On the flip, flip side, yes. <laughs> on the flip, flip side, what, uh, uh, going back to what Chen was saying, the aspect that worries me the most is in this transition period, as we have a lot of uh, companies that are deeply entangled 
with the Chinese market and probably will remain in the near future, to what extent U.S. policy can be independent from China, to what extent China is able to really manipulate the conversation in, the, in this country. If you have the large companies that want something and you have a lot of the think tanks, etc., who are afraid to actually pick a bottle on, on this front, you know, the, the, the Stigler Center ran a series of conferences on, uh, on China to debate these topics. Uh, and by the way, they are, they are available on the, the YouTube channel of the Stigler Center. But a lot of other centers did not want to associate, etc. People are don't want to touch, for example, the, the Hong Kong topic. If you want to have any relation with China, the Hong, to- the Hong Kong topic is radioactive. Uh, not to mention, of course, Tibet or or the Uyghurs or, or, or civil rights. So, so now uh, you start to have a bunch of companies who don't want uh, their employees to tweet about these things. So. If you are a company heavily invested in in China, uh, you're putting restriction on what your employees write on Twitter about China. That starts to really have an impact in the marketplace of ideas in a way that uh, Nazi Germany could not even dream uh, to do. Yeah. This is a slightly different point, but I was thinking as you talked that it is interesting, the number of American companies, as we covered on this podcast, that pulled out of Russia in the wake of the invasion of of Ukraine, and yet China supported Russia in the invasion of Ukraine. And you don't have any ongoing discussion of whether American companies should be doing business in China or not, because the costs are simply too, too high. And so there is a little bit of hypocrisy at work. Now, that's not quite fair. I was reading a Financial Times piece uh, just before we recorded this that that speculated um, based on some demotions within the Chinese party that even um, officials in China weren't aware of, of how strong Russia's movement against Ukraine was going to be and that they weren't anticipating it and they were surprised by it. But nonetheless, China has voiced support for Russia in, 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 in Ukraine. And yet there's no, there, there's, 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 there's no discussion about the morality then of continuing to do business in China. But you remember that when we interview Richard Edelman and he was talking about why companies were so gang-ho in uh, uh, boycotting Russia, I did ask him what would happen with China. You did, that's right. Yeah, and he said, no, China, no. Right. Exactly, because (laughs) it's the cost. There is a morality, but morality has a price. (laughs) Yeah. Mm. (laughs) We just finished watching in my household The Good Place. Morality is not supposed to have a price. (laughs) Nor is morality supposed to be outcome-driven. It's supposed to be pure. If it's outcome-driven, you don't get any points. <laughs> you don't get any points by putting a price on it. I'm just kidding. Um, but but all of those all of those are really interesting questions. But I, I really like talking to Chang for the most part because he didn't pretend there were easy answers. I thought that was. And I also, my other favorite thing about our conversation with him was that he blanked on Elon Musk's name. I thought that was priceless. But uh, what I also like is... Uh, he had a very interesting strategy to uh, engage with China that uh, basically is playing with China with Chinese rules or Chinese strategy. Because uh, he made an example about, uh, uh, which is a very delicate topic for Chicago Booth, because as you know, we have a campus in, China, in Hong Kong that at the moment is frozen because of COVID, nobody going in and out, but uh, uh, is supposed to be active. And uh, uh, Hong Kong used to be a place uh, with freedom of speech, and it's not anymore. Uh, You can be detained if you say something that is even vaguely considered sort of uh, um, inciting the independence of Hong Kong or threatening the national security, which is vague enough. Anything can threaten national security, even an opinion about COVID can threaten national security of China. Um, And he said, uh, the, the right strategy is to engage because they want something from you, and uh, but engage bundling that engagement with a part they don't like, which is uh, op- the, basically the opposite strategy that China used with the West. You, you want to come here, and yes, you come here, but you have to share the technology, whether willing or unwilling, but you, you're going to share the technology with us as a condition of. So we bundle something you don't like with something you like, and, uh, and that's what we should do. 
Now, to what extent uh, Western uh, institutions, not just firms, but institutions like the University of Chicago, are actually willing to do that, that remains to be seen. But, that, but I, I think it's a very clever strategy. Someone should rewrite Machiavelli's rules for the for the, for, our, for our current time, and it should include this concept of bundling. Maybe it already did <laughs> in some way. Maybe I need to go back and read my Machiavelli. But that, doesn't it sound classically Mach- Machiavellian? Yeah, it is. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine, with production assistance from Utsoff Gandhi, Sebastian Berka, Chris Wheat, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for Capitalism wherever you get your podcasts. 